In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the World Wide Web and how to connect to it. Most people on the Internet used to be either a consumer or a creator, but things are changing so people can be both. Think of Facebook. You're both. You read what other people put up and you put up your own, own information as well. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between the web and the Internet. The Internet, and yes, it is a capital I because there is only one Internet, so it is a proper noun, is the global network of interconnected computers. This is different than the web. The Internet is all the hardware tying everybody together, all of the physical connections and the computers, the servers, the actual T1 lines, all the lines connecting everything. The World Wide Web, or Web for short, is a way of accessing the Internet. It uses HTTP, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and it really, that's the web pages, the connectivity, everything that's content on the web. You're going to need a few things to be able to get online. First, you'll need an Internet Service Provider, shortened to ISP and that's the company that you pay to provide you access to the Internet. Many of these Internet service providers are telephone companies or work over telephone wires, though they can also be cable companies or other tele telecommunications companies. Originally, it was a separate company like AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe, but today your big players are AT&T, Comcast, Charter, um, there are other types of internet you can get as well. Let's look and talk about connection speeds. Generally you want the fastest internet that you can get for the lowest possible price. That's your best buy. Generally that's going to be cable. Cable is extremely fast. It has downloads of 25 to 100 megabits per second. The higher the number, the better. It has upload speeds of 2 to 8 megabits per second. And it will cost, in most areas, around 40 to $60 per month. And often you can choose how fast you're paying for because you pay more for faster access. You'll notice on the right hand side of the screen I have a couple of sources I used when doing research on the connection speeds. DSL is hosted over the traditional copper wires probably already coming to your house often sold by AT&T or another local phone service and download speeds of typically 1.5 to 15 megabytes per second and upload speeds of 1 point or 120 kilobytes which is less than a millibyte to 1.0 megabytes per second and the cost is very similar to cable you can also use a wireless internet connector and you can do that by searching the web on your phone a tablet that's connected to your service provider for your phone. You can use your phone as a hotspot or you can buy a separate hotspot or adapter for your laptop and other devices. And that's typically, it's very fast. With a 4G you can get up to 50 megabytes per second which is comparable to some of the lower speeds of cable and faster than DSL. It can be a little pricey though. It prices vary but it can be a little pricey per month and many of them have limits on how much bandwidth you're allowed to use per month or you pay by the um, by the amount that you're using. You can also use wireless line of sight radio signals. Those are usually coming from water towers and broadcasting to dishes on the top of your house, antennas to catch the signal. That's typically used in your more rural areas. My parents live on a farm. They can't get DSL or cable. That's what they use to get a reasonably fast internet for a fair price. Satellite is for extremely rural areas. It's slow and expensive so it's generally not a good choice. What do you need to set up an internet connection for your house? Well, this is assuming that you are putting together a Wi-Fi spot or network in your cl in your house. First, you're going to get your ISP, and you're going to pay for your service so that there's service coming to your house. Once it gets into your house, you need some sort of modem. Modem stands for modular modulator demodulator, and it used to 
be used with the old dial-up lines where it would change sound waves into 0101 binary code and that's what the modem did now it's going to take whatever signals coming into the house and it's going to come into your modem and then you may have that is one unit with the modem and a router or you may connect your modem to your router what your router does is it splits the signal and allows multiple devices to use it typically on one of today's routers you'll have five connections in the back and almost unlimited connections for wireless connectivity You'll, uh, then on whatever device you're using, you're going to need some sort of network interface card that's usually integrated, not something you buy. It's usually already in your device. And what that does is it actually listens for or receives the signal coming from your router. And then, of course, you'll need the computer, the device that you're going to connect to the Internet with. Now, for your home security, it's very important to set up your home router with some basic security. Several years ago, I went to a conference that had somebody from the FBI speaking at the conference about wireless networks. And he was talking about having gone into a home and arrested somebody under suspicion of downloading child porn. But when they checked the person's computers, all of his computers were clean. What had happened was his next door neighbor, he was in an apartment, and his signal was very clear to the neighbor next door. He hadn't done password protection, and his neighbor was using his connection to steal internet signal, and he's the one who was doing something illegal. Make sure to password protect your network. You don't want somebody outside of your home getting access to your files or your network. When you buy a router, you do have an option, typically, of buying a slightly higher level router that will allow for guest access. And if you have kids in your home, I recommend this because I don't want outside people having access to my files, but I don't mind when my kids have friends over letting them have access to the internet. So I have a guest password that gives them internet access only, but doesn't give them access to my shared resources on my network. Now, when you're setting up your, your network you want to make sure to have your basic fundamental security at very very minimum password protect your network but I prefer to go to one higher level at minimum don't broadcast your network ID many of your routers have the option to not broadcast so that if you have a mobile device and you bring up the available networks it won't show up you have to type in the name of the network and the goal of security is to be harder to break into than the person next door. And if there are five visible networks and your network is not visible, people are unlikely to look for the network that they can't see. They're more likely to try to break into one that they can see. If you need to be more secure than that, you can limit the specific devices that can connect by their MAC address. Your best bet is to be completely wired but that's not very reasonable in today's times because it wouldn't work with Kindle and mobile devices. Let's talk about a browser. I'm concerned often when I teach this class, people don't actually know the difference between a browser and an internet service provider. Now when AOL and CompuServe were the primary ways to get online, that was very understandable because AOL was a bunch of things in one. They had their own browser, even though AOL was the company that you would pay $19.95 a month to get online. But today, our browsers are commonly Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, and Safari. Those are the five big ones. And they d translate the content of the programmed web pages into something visible that you can click on, work with, view, and interact with. And they also have additional tools, pop-up blockers, spell checkers, and can manage how you use the Internet by saving passwords, by saving your favorites, by creating shortcuts. So there's a, some additional features in each one. They usually have tab browsing, spell check, things like that. Our right, first link here is a review of the top 10 browsers. And it'll take a second. There we go. And this is a good review of the top 10 browsers, and it compares them 
by speed, by feature set, by security, by ease of use, by help and support. Right now, Chrome is considered the best, and it's also the most commonly used. Firefox is considered second best. It is the second most commonly used. Then you have Internet. Now, Opera is rated higher than Safari. Safari gets slightly more use than Opera. And you can look at the different tools and compatibility. It's interesting to note that Internet Explorer from Microsoft does not run on a Mac. So these are things that you can look for in picking which browser you want to use. Now you'll also, on my second link, this takes you to the w3schools.com. And I love the W3Schools. I use their site a lot. And this has browser statistics and trends. And as a designer, I look at the trends trying to decide what browsers I should design for, where I need to test for, what's commonly in use. And it's important to notice that over time, things have changed. Chrome hasn't always existed. In fact, we saw Chrome come on the scene in about 2008, and it took it a while to hit majority rule. But this tells you sort of what's being used currently, which, if you're a designer, is important. There are several programming languages that make up the Internet. The very base core of a static web page, the very minimum, you need an HTML page. HTML and the information here on the left hand side just sort of shows the history of how HTML has evolved. It started with SGML, which is a standard generalized markup language. That's the markup language, the formatting language behind word processing engines like Word or WordPerfect. And that's where the hypertext markup language, HTML, evolved from. It evolved from word processing software. And it's had several versions. Years ago, in 1997, when I was taking my first college class in programming for the Internet, I was using a book on HTML 1.0. And it had a cheat sheet where I could pull out all of the commands on one side of one page. Now, that didn't describe them all and everything that they could do. But still, it was a very small set of instructions. So you had a lot of limits to the formatting that you could do on the Internet. As time has gone on, different features have been added and HTML has gotten more powerful. In the early 2000s, there was a move to move away from HTML and to XHTML. And that was because their thought was that you could make it extensible, something that you could specify your own tags for. So it was combining two languages, XML, which was a data transfer language used to move information from a database to another database, can be used by all programming languages, and HTML. But there was another group that didn't agree with the direction that XHTML was going. So they kept working on the HTML5 specification. And it was a toss-up for a while to see which one was going to win. HTML5 appears very strongly to have won. The specification is being used, and it has a lot of really cool features. And you're seeing it used across most of the modern browsers, even though the specification has not been fully approved by the W3C. That's your World Wide Web Consortium. And they are the standards body for the Internet. CSS works hand in hand with HTML. HTML is supposed to be used for the informational content on your page. CSS is supposed to be used for styling your page, for setting your fonts, your colors, your page layout. And the nice thing is, if you do design properly according to standards, you can write the HTML once, and you can have a different style sheet for each type of device or screen size that might be accessing your page. So you can get a completely different layout and look for a phone, a tablet, a computer, a widescreen TV. It lets you have total control. You can also have a style sheet just for printing. All formatting should be done in CSS and all content should be done in HTML. And that's not necessarily a given because in the early versions of HTML you could do formatting. The third language that gets written in your actual web page document, sometimes you can call it externally as well, is JavaScript. And JavaScript allows interactivity
activity. It lets you do some simple things that where it can actually interact with the user. It can work with forms for checking form validation. It can change the color of your page. It can be used for simple animation. And it's typed right into the HTML document or a similar document that's on your server in the same folder or at least on your server in the same site. All the programming is run by your browser. The HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, that's all interpreted by Chrome, Firefox, one of the browsers. That makes it a client-side programming language because it's interpreted by software on the user's computer instead of running on the web server. When you create a web application, it's much more complicated than that. Typically, you will have some sort of database that's hosting information. Then you'll have a middle layer that's a programmed language that passes information back and forth from the database on the web server to the client's computer. And then a user interface, which is created in HTML with CSS and JavaScript. So an example of a web application would be something like Facebook. All of the data is stored in a giant database. There's a programming language that takes that data back and forth from the server and the user's device. And then there's the interface, which is done in HTML. When you make web pages, back in the 1990s, there was really limited formatting. So web pages were kind of either plain or really ugly, depending on who designed them. And most web pages back in the mid to late 1990s were created by programmers because you had to hand code to be able to make a web page. In the late 1990s, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, editors became commonplace. And things like Dreamweaver, Go Live and other software evolved to make designing websites something that you could do visually and interactively without having to know how to program. We've also gone in the world of web development from having somebody who did it all, a webmaster, to getting specializations. One of the primary specializations is a web designer. They do the layout, pick the colors, pick the fonts, make it beautiful, make it functional. And that's done typically in Photoshop or a similar program. Then the web designer will hand that off to a web developer who is going to create the code, run the database, and do all of the back end work. There's a much higher demand for web developers than there is for web designers and web developers are paid about twice as much. A good web designer is making about forty to forty five thousand dollars a year. A good web developer can easily make twice that.